Hello and welcome to today's Countdown to Tampa, episode number two. I am your host, Jeremy Speaks, and this is, of course, my podcast, Jeremy Speaks on Wrestling. Like, share, subscribe, comment, criticize. It is all welcome. I thank you for taking time out of your day to listen to something I may have to say. And today we are going to continue our countdown of WrestleManias. Now, I was supposed to put one out yesterday. For some reason, it didn't work the way I wanted it to. I didn't want it to, you know, I wanted it to put it out and have it on time. But sometimes there are technical difficulties, which kind of let you know that you're going the right way. Anyway, like, share, subscribe, comment, criticize. You can like me on Facebook. You can like me uh, on Instagram, on Twitter. I'm there. Um, You can check out my YouTube channel, Jeremy Speaks. I will start uploading only episodes of my social commentary to my Jeremy Speaks channel. And I will upload all wrestling content to my The Negro Sports League channel. I'll probably be live streaming Madden uh, in the coming weeks as well there. So you can check me out there as well. Now, let's get into today's topic. Today's topic is WrestleMania 2. It was the second WrestleMania, of course. Uh, The name kind of gives it away. And it happened April the 7th, 1986. And it happened... On a Monday, which is, uh, you know, making it the only WrestleMania that wasn't held on a traditional Sunday. Because everyone knows that Sunday is WrestleMania Day. Now, the week leading up may be a lot of different things. But Sunday is specifically designed for WrestleMania. You don't run any shows. You don't run any, any, as far as the world of wrestling goes, you don't run anything the week of WrestleMania. But this WrestleMania was different because it took place in three different states and separate venues. This has never happened since. Uh, one part of WrestleMania took the first part took place in New York at the Nassau Veteran Memorial Coliseum. Uh, the second one, uh, second part of it, uh, each venue had its own card. So uh, the Rosemont Horizon uh, in Illinois uh, and the Los Angeles Memorial Sports Arena in Los Angeles, California. Uh, it had a combined attendance of 40,000, which back then, you know, I. Now they put like 80,000 in the stadium, so that's that's not really anything uh, to brag on nowadays. 40,000 combined over three venues and three time zones. Eh. I, I, I applaud McMahon for being ambitious, but I can only imagine how much something like that would cost nowadays with the technology that we have. Um, but the second WrestleMania came on the heels of the success of WrestleMania 1. Uh, WrestleMania would become the WWE's flagship event. It has since become the longest running professional wrestling event in history and is held annually as of now between mid-March and mid-April. WrestleMania would eventually be described as the Super Bowl of sports entertainment. Now, the broadcasters, each event featured separate commentary. Um, The commentary of Vince McMahon and Susan St. James was in New York, Gorilla Monsoon and Gene Oakland, and someone named Kathleen Crosby was in Chicago. And Jesse Ventura, Alfred Hayes, and Elvira, who at the time was a star, was in Los Angeles. Uh, The ring announcers were Howard Finkel, Lee Marshall, and Chet Kopak. I guess that's how you pronounce his name. Now, getting into the WrestleMania, now I, I get what McMahon wanted to do. Uh, it, it took a set of cojones, cabron, to uh, pull something out like this off. Ray Charles sang uh, America the Beautiful in New York. Um, they had a lot of celebrities. They had, of course, WrestleMania is synonymous with doing things with celebrities. Uh, you can look at the poster and see that the draw was, uh, you know, like my thumbnail shows only two, three participants in that WrestleMania, but it was a lot of people there. Uh, Daryl Dawkins, they used to call him Chocolate Thunder, Joan Rivers, Joe Frazier, um, Susan St. James, uh, Dick Butkus was in Chicago, Ed Tutal Jones, Ozzy Osbourne, Ernie Holmes, Harvey Martin. Uh, the Los Angeles segment included Robert Conrad, Tommy Lasorda, and Elvira. Now, there was 12 matches on the card, and uh, the results, of course, People like to say it's predetermined. Of course, it's entertainment. What name? Name something in entertainment that isn't pre-recorded. Somebody once told me live PD uh, is is real. If it's on TV, it has an element of stage to it. Let's just go ahead and put that out there. You know, I see basket. I saw a basketball play the other night where LeBron James got hit in the face and and flopped on the floor like he was selling for WWE. And people got a nerve to call wrestling fake. Even soccer players flop all around. I didn't know when it became so popular to fake it. Anyway, um, 
the main feud heading into WrestleMania 2 was between Hulk Hogan and King Kong Bundy over the WWF at the time championship. Uh, their first nationally televised encounter was November 2nd of 1985. And that, you know, back back in those days, they would plan out storylines a year in advance, it seems like. Like, now they just change it on the fly. I get that you want to change with the times, but some basic things about wrestling have to be the same. Uh, I saw Joan Rivers at this WrestleMania, and I was shocked that at one particular point in time, she actually looked like a person. Um, it's crazy to think about what this woman ended up looking like after all those plastic surgeries, but she actually looks like a, a, a person. She looked like she was drunk, too. I will say that. Um, the second feud uh, uh, leading into WrestleMania to hype it up was uh, Mr. T and Roddy Piper. Piper was the top heel in WWE. Um, he uh, They restarted this feud after WrestleMania 1 because, you know, they really hated each other. They did not like each other at all. So, of course, WWE being WWE, you're going to take it. If it's real and people can feel it and the tension is palpable in the room, of course you turn that into money. That's what rap music is centered on nowadays. Killing and drugs and all that, you know, that's that's what it is. Mumbling shit and getting high. That's what rap music is. But you turn that into money. You turn hate into money because you can print money off of that. Um, but Piper hated Mr. T. Because back in those days, you had to sacrifice and prove that you belong in there. And Roddy Piper did not like the fact that there was an actor just getting a shot or, you know, at WrestleMania that some guys couldn't get. Anyway, they had a boxing match. Um, uh, Piper said he had no wrestling uh, skills. And, you know, after that, Mr. T became a special WWF boxing being compete began competing in boxing matches. Um, he did defeat. Orton, uh, Bob Orton, who was there at the time, uh, he f defeated him in a boxing match. But that that we'll get more on that later. And the third feud heading into it was the Dream Team: uh, Greg Valentine and Brutus Beefcake versus the British Bulldogs, David Boy Smith and the Dynamite Kid. Uh, in New York, we'll get to that in a minute. And the first match of the show was in New York, where Paul Orndorff faced the Mar magnificent Morocco. Uh, Orndorff body slammed him, uh, the crowd reacted, and Orndorff celebrated, but he turned towards Mr. Fuji and made a, generally what's considered a racist. Uh, I, I, wrestling is a reflection of life. If it's happening in real life and people thinking in real life, then it's going to happen on wrestling. At least in 1985 it would. But he, he did the whole uh, slant, I think, at Mr. Fuji. Um, and he, he made an Italian salute after that. Uh, it's edited out of the network, by the way. They they didn't leave that part in there. They uh, edited it out of the home video, and you know, but the match ended in a double countout. See, people weren't as sensitive uh, back then as they are now to stuff like that. Like you can't do anything anymore. You can't have an independent thought outside of what you're supposed to think. You know? Whatever. That's a, that's a story for another day. Uh, after the first match. Uh, the Intercontinental Heavyweight Championship match was between Macho Man and George the Animal Steel. Uh, George the Animal Steel became the very first person in this match to ever kick out of the Macho Man's elbow. And when I went back and rewatched it, because it's been decades since I watched WrestleMania 2, I went back and rewatched it. I realized just how important that moment was. Nobody ever kicked out of Savage's elbow, ever. But. Savage being who, I mean, Animal Steel tore up the turnbuckles and put uh, whatever was in the turnbuckle in his face, and he did all kind of stuff to him. But, I mean, he whooped him with flowers, and he chased Miss Elizabeth. and But in the end, Randy beat him with a roll-up because he put his feet on the ropes, and the ref didn't see it. So that's, you know, you cheat to win when you the heel. Macho Man, of course, at WrestleMania 2 would retain the Intercontinental title. Um the next match from uh, the Coliseum was between Jake Roberts and George Wells. Um, of course, this match was, it felt like filler when I watched it because I, and I'll say that because I don't really remember George Wells. I don't know if he was a great worker in his day or in his territory at the time. I don't really remember him, but Roberts hit him with a DDT and uh, pinned him. Now, after the match is where things got, you know, ugh. I couldn't stand Jake the Snake's snake. When he took that snake out the bag and wrapped it around people, that shit is horrifying to me. 
It's a big ass boa constrictor he wrapped around this man. But this guy obviously had no problem with snakes because he played it up like it was a big deal. Foaming at the mouth like the snake choked him out and everything. He played it up like it was a big deal. Um, that, ugh, I, ugh, I just, I can't do it. <laughs> now, on to the main event of the first uh, card in New York. Uh, it was between Mr. T and Rowdy Roddy Piper. Now, Mr. T had Joe Frazier in his corner, while Roddy Piper had Lou, I want to say this name, his last name is Duva. Um, yeah, but they, they in the first round, the little Roddy wanted to kill him. Of course he wanted to kill him. You know, you know you just, but Mr. T was an actor, and at that time, you don't get to just walk in. But, see, Roddy Piper couldn't see the big picture of what Mr. T actually brought. At the time, you know, it was old school mentality. Uh, he don't belong in our world. He ain't put in the time. He ain't sacrificed. I mean, Roddy Piper talks about when he was 15, and uh, he was in the car with some veterans when he started wrestling, and they dropped him off at the store, and they told him, go in there and get us some sandwiches, kid. And he went in and got the sandwiches. And he came out. They had drove off. He had to walk three miles to get to that car. Three miles. Anyway, that which I mean that, and in my opinion, I, I see where Piper's coming from. But Mr. T brought eyes that weren't generally on the product. That that's something that Vince was always able to do. He kept he brought Hollywood into wrestling and made it mainstream. The, the war to settle the score in '85 and Cindy Lauper and all that. He brought it into the mainstream, but it had to be real. Anyway, in this match, uh, right, they go at it in the first round. Ryder Piper wants to kill him. That's evident from the time. But they go uh, three, no, excuse me, they go four rounds. And, you know, Mr. Uh, Roddy Piper got angry in the match. He wanted him to fight him, but Mr. T, in my opinion, wouldn't fight him. Like, he was an actor playing a role. Well, Ryder Piper wanted to kill him, so in the third uh Fourth round, third or fourth round, he picked up the stool and he slung it at him and he hit him in the leg with a stool and it took a chunk out of his leg. Uh, at that point for Mr. T, it was real, I think. like he, he understood what he was in there with. You figure the guys would respect each other after this match, but, you know, Roddy Piper being Roddy Piper, uh, he got disqualified for body slamming Mr. T uh, with a minute 15 left to go or a minute 15 in the fourth round. So, Mr. T won. I mean, yeah, no celebrity really loses at WrestleMania, but, you know, it is what it is. Uh, but I think he spit on him, or somebody spit on Ryder Piper at this WrestleMania, too. He wanted to, he was baiting him in. He wanted him to fight, but he wouldn't do it. But from there, uh, they would move on to the Chicago portion of WrestleMania, which opened with a WWF Women's Championship match between the fabulous Moolah and Velvet McIntyre. Uh, McIntyre would attempt to splash on Moolah from the second turnbuckle. Moolah would sidestep McIntyre, and Moolah took advantage of that, and she pinned McIntyre to retain her title. You know, she was women's champion for 28 years, I want to say. Um, the second match in Chicago was a flag match between Corporal Kirshner and Nicole Nikita uh, Nikolai Volkov. Flatty, Freddie Blassie came out with Volkov. Um, and it was a back and forth, of course, a couple of moves hit, of course, both guys, it seems like in the early WrestleManias, nobody ever wanted to look weak coming out of the WrestleMania. So, you know, it, it's a lot of dirty, fin uh, dusty finishes. Uh, this would be no different. Uh, Flirty Blassie threw his cane in, uh, to Volkov, but Kirshner would catch it and hit Volkov with it and then successfully pinned him for the victory. Um, which, like I said, guys want to look strong. Like, if you pin him after the heel manager throws in an object, obviously, you should, you know, you got hit with your own weapon. It's like the Mick Foley thumbtack rule. Like, if you bring, if Mick Foley would bring the thumbtacks in the ring, he would never, ever, ever get to put the guy on it. The guy, he would always end up on the thumbtacks. But if his opponent brought him in, then they would end up on him. Uh, the third match, which, you know, once again, celebrities being used, uh, right in with the with the product later in later years they would become to be used on the peripheral. Um, the third match was a twenty man battle royal battle royal involving WWF wrestlers and National Football League players. Those players included Jimbo Covert, uh, Bill Fralick, Russ Francis, 
Ernie Holmes, Harvey Martin, and William the Refrigerator Perry, who was the draw for Chicago. At the time, the Bears were huge. We are the Bears, the Super Bowl shuffle, all that stuff. It was huge. Um, the WWF had their own stars. It was Ted RCD, Tony Atlas, the Hart Foundation, which considered, consisted of Bret Hart and Jim the Alvin Nineheart, the Killer Bees, Hit Billy Jim, the Iron Sheet, King Tonga, Pedro Morales, Bruno San Martino, Dan Spivey, Big John Studd, and Andre the Giant. Uh, Andre the Giant uh, in the end of the man. And like it was, it was what you expect out of a celebrity battle royal. It was some uh, spots in there, like when Refrigerator Perry was eliminated by Big John Studd, and Big John Studd reached out to shake his hand, and Perry was like, "All right, all right, you the better man." Of course, it's wrestling leaving the star. Wrestling always makes the star look bigger than re- you know. Like I hate that about it, but it's wrestling. Uh, they have a bottom line. But as Big John Studd went to shake William the Refrigerator Perry's hand, he would pull him out and eliminate him. Dirty move, but you know, whatever. In the end of the match, Andre the Giant and both members of the Heart Foundation were the final three participants. Andre was the first eliminated. Uh, Excuse me. Andre first eliminated Neidhart and then Hart to win the Battle Royal. Of course, Andre was going to win it. Andre, anybody want a peanut? (laughs) From the Princess Bride. Andre was bigger than life at the time, and he was the booker. He held a book. But they did make those guys look good. None of them looked weak. Um and it's, it's enjoyable. It's kind of like the gimmick battle royal from 17, but more on that later. The last match in Chicago was a WWF tag team match between the British Bulldogs, who consisted of David Boy Smith and the Dynamite Kid versus the Dream Team, which consisted of Greg the Valentine and Brutus Beefcake. Um, Ex-Black Sabbath lead singer Ozzy Osbourne and Lou Albano came out with the Bulldogs. Now, this match was... Um, I'll say that this match was good for what it was, in my opinion. I do keep in mind that the opinions expressed those sincerely and only of Jeremy Speaks uh, as I speak on wrestling. So if you take offense to it, then I apologize. If, uh, if you take offense to it or you don't honor my opinion as valid as yours, but this is my podcast, so I'm going to talk about how it makes me feel. Anyway, went off on a tangent right quick. Um, Smith would uh, push Valentine into the corner uh, where Valentine would knock heads with Dynamite Kid. Kid would fall to the floor while Smith pinned Valentine to win the tag team titles from the Dream Team. And they had them for seven months. You know, you had to have a strong team going into WrestleMania. You had to have a strong team going into WrestleMania. And you had to have a, a team that you were pushing to beat them. They don't care about tag team wrestling like they used to. I guess because they had to fill the card. Uh, in Los Angeles, there were four more matches. Now, you got to think, people in New York just sat through their show and they watched uh, Chicago on giant screens. When WrestleMania would end in one place, they put it on giant screens so the people that weren't in Chicago or weren't in L.A. could watch it. So, the people in New York are still sitting there watching you know, the action in Chicago. And then when the action in Chicago ends, the people from New York and Chicago watch the action in L.A. Um, in Los Angeles, as I stated, there were four matches. Ricky Steamboat would face Hernandez in the first match. Um, at some point in the match, Hercules tried to hit a flying body press, missed it. Steamboat would follow by hitting a flying body press for a successful pinfall victory. Uh, Adrian Adonis, uh, who was accompanied by Jimmy Hart, defeated Uncle Elmer with the diving head. But like Adrian Adonis, I don't know if he was... You know, he had on a makeup, a wig, and a dress, and he was the only man I saw dressed as a woman that was ugly as both a man and a woman, right? I don't think he was trying, though. You know, that's whatever. Uh, I don't mean to speak ill of the dead. The next match had the Funk Brothers facing Junkyard Dog and Tito Santana in a tag team match. Of course, Jimmy Hart uh, accompanied the Funk Brothers. Um, One of the Funks distracted the referee, Hart took advantage and gave his microphone to Terry Funk, who hit Junkyard Dog and then pinned him to get the win. See, like like I stated, in a lot of these early WrestleManias, a lot of the guys were reluctant to go under or look weak or to, you know, like Ryder Ryder Piper and Mr. T. Like, he refused to look weak to an actor. You can't go back and get the respect of the boys if you look weak out there in the ring. 
you know? So you, you, a lot of dusty finishes, a lot of dirty pins and stuff like that. And throughout the entire card. Um, now, on to the main event of WrestleMania 2, which was a World Heavyweight Championship match for the WWE title in a steel cage match between Hulk Hogan and King Kong Bundy. Now, it's kind of like I get why you would put King Kong Bundy in there at the time. He's a big guy. He's massive. Nobody was beating him. But Hogan's going to work with King Kong Bundy, right? In a steel cage in L.A. Um, Tommy Lasorda would do the ring announcing uh, as far as introducing the competitors. Um, some kid actor was out there in the ring at the time. But King Kong Bundy looked massive. And I get why Hogan wanted to work with him. And I get why Vince wanted Hogan to work with him. Um, if you look at pictures of the crowd, I don't know if they've darkened it on the network like that, but that arena was pretty damn empty. Um, it wasn't a lot of people in there, which is prob which probably contributes to the fact that Vince never tried to do anything like this again. Um, I get what he was trying to accomplish, but it just, it wouldn't work. Now, King Kong Bundy was accompanied by Bobby Heenan and, King Kong Bundy was a big deal. He was an attraction. But once Hogan works with you, you know how, especially in the 80s, you know how it's going to go, brother. I know it's the main event. But what did it do for King Kong Bundy after this? Yeah, he became a member of the Heenan family. But, I mean, you're wrestling in the main event against Hulk Hogan for the title in a steel cage. Not just a steel cage. That big, ugly, blue, heavy-looking bastard. That steel cage was ugly. When people hit it, like, it, 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 it sounded off. And it took about four to five minutes to put up. Anyway, you knew it wasn't going to be a long night with Hogan. But Tommy Lasorda introduced himself to King Kong Bundy. Uh, I, it was awkward seeing people out of character or whatnot, you know, like, especially when you're supposed to be this uber heel. The match went about as much as suspected it would go in a Hogan match. Hogan obviously had to come out with the handicap with the ribs taped up. Um, at the start of the match, Bundy removed the tape from his ribs because um, Hogan's ribs were heavily taped by an assault uh, by Bundy on March 1st, 1986 on Saturday night's main event where, you know, Bobby Heenan was out there, too. So that don't ever hurt to have a brain in your corner. He was out there, and, of course, that's why you get the upper hand. Hogan always had to get the sympathy from the crowd, you know, but you couldn't beat Hogan. You know, Hogan would always find a way to hook up. Oh, he desperately gets there as Bundy tries to escape the cage every single time. Bundy should have just sat on him. <laughs> um uh, like I said, he removed some of the tape. However, Hogan fought back and would eventually ram Bundy's head into the steel cage. He tried to hit a scoop slam on Bundy, but missed it. Bundy would then hit an avalanche and a big splash on Hogan. Now, Bundy would hit this on regular people. He would hit this on people regularly, and they wouldn't kick out. Not only would they not kick out, but he would get a three count plus, a, plus two. Bundy would always ask for the five count. Hogan, being Hogan, hooked up. And you know, Hogan had to be the biggest, baddest in the jungle. I get why Bundy wasn't complaining. Uh, you work with Hogan, that check's going to be a little bit bigger, brother. Um, Hogan would hook up and hit a power slam on Bundy. Caught, he did his pose, put the hand to the ear, and he followed it with a leg drop, which you would think would be it. But Hogan would instead try to climb out of the cage. Bundy would catch his legs. When he, caught, when he caught his legs, he would kick Bundy in the head to get him off him. And then Bundy fall, would fall back, and Hogan would climb over the steel cage down to the floor to win the match and retain the title. Hogan then would go after the weasel because, you know, I, everybody loves Bobby the Brain Heenan. He went after brain, uh, the Brain, and Hogan rammed his head into the steel cage before hitting him with the 1980s, one of the most devastating moves from the 1980s. He hit him with an atomic drop. Hogan would then pose his ass off like he always does and then head right back to the locker room. Yep, that is a uh, macho man and animal still would continue that feud after that. You know, um, on Saturday night's main event, they would uh, 
they would always fight back and forth through 86 and 87, but um, Savage would then continue to be healing, go on a feud with Hogan. Hogan. Um, uh, the British Bulldogs would go on to success. What they, they were getting pushed at Mania by winning the titles from a team that had them for seven months. Hogan continued his reign. Andre the Giant's career was at a crossroads. Um, he was beginning to suffer the health effects that would eventually take his life. Um, w, uh, Wrestle, here's a side note. WrestleMania 2 would also mark the last major pay-per-view appearance for Roddy Piper during his initial heel turn. Shortly before the event, he takes four weeks worth of Piper pit. And he took a hiatus from the ring. Which is okay. Piper had been going... Uh, Piper had been going hard for a while. Uh, critical response to the show was poor. Um, people criticized the fact that my man tried to hold it, host it at three events, but you don't know where your ceiling is until you attempt to hit your ceiling. Um, that's just, that's just you know, you don't know how far to go until you take it that far. Um, some people said that the Piper Mr. T boxing match was poor. They attributed it to being all across the you know, three different time zones for one show, yeah. In my opinion, the match between Hogan and Bundy felt more like a, a Saudi show nowadays. We have Saudi shows. It felt like they was just phoning it in. And I get it, you know. Bundy even got busted open in the match, and I really don't think the crowd cared, you know. I don't think the crowd cared. But Hogan was your champion. Hogan, Hogan was victorious in the main event of WrestleMania two. I, th- I hope you enjoyed my show today. I hope you enjoyed my review of WrestleMania 2. I have been Jeremy Speaks. Please like, share, subscribe, comment, and criticize. It is all welcome as long as you listen. Uh, there will be a WrestleMania 3 review coming up shortly uh, later on tonight. I may drop it. I may drop it tonight. I may drop it in the morning as of this recording in this afternoon. But we'll see how it goes. Time is is, you know. It's not enough time in a day to get everything you want done, done. But like, share, subscribe, comment, criticize. Thank you for your support. Continue to support the podcast. Uh, There will be a review of WrestleMania 3. I'm going to try to squeeze these out at least once a day all the way up until my WrestleMania trip where I will do a live one immediately following WrestleMania. Um, But until then, join me next time here on Spreaker. I've been Jeremy Speaks.